Hello, you are listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio, your global feel-good radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, our guest today is Veronica Lynn Clark. Veronica Lynn Clark is an intimacy and empowerment coach, and you can find out more about Veronica Lynn Clark and her wonderful work at veronicalynnclark.com. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Veronica Lynn Clark. Catherine, thanks so much for having me on the show today. I, I've really been looking forward to this, to be able to share with the audience, with, with my clients as well, um, just some of this work that I've been doing. And, and yeah, so I'm really, really appreciative about being here on the show. Thank you. All right. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is how to heal from sexual trauma. And sexual trauma is yeah. just one of many forms of abuse. Now, I know that you yeah. yourself recovered from sexual abuse, what were some of the biggest challenges that you had to overcome with regards to sexual abuse? Mm. Okay, so we're going to start from the beginning. So my abuse started when I was when I was just in my developmental stages. The first incident of abuse began when I was about four years old. It's very confusing, right? And then it, and then it became more, um, more, just predominant in my life about the age of six, where it was like on a regular basis. And these were different people who were, were offending me. And the thing is, I, so the thing is, is that sexual abuse, when it's introduced at such a young age, it's super confusing because you're not really sure. I wasn't sure at that time. Is this right? Is it wrong? What's really happening here? You know, I knew that there was a level of um, secrecy, so to speak. But I didn't necessarily know that what was happening was wrong. So I say that because as I started to get older and one particular um, phase of this abuse, because it, it went on from consistently from ages six to like 17 years old. You know, the first incident started when I was four. So threaded throughout that when it's happening and it's a family member, and the family member is kind, it's really confusing. So there's this idea that I'm supposed to keep a secret. It's really not bad that's happening, but I don't tell anybody about it. Um, so there was a lot of different types of behaviors that started to come as a result of that. So I think one of the main things of um, having to overcome was how's my own personal sexuality wrapped up in this? And it was really difficult to, really difficult to become um, sexual as an adult person because of this, just because of the way that the abuse started to impact me from the very, very beginning, which was the confusion. Now, as it progressed, there was other types of behaviors that came about. Um, my own, my own worthiness, my own, you know, am I good enough? I'm, and not even so much am I good enough in relation to my family itself but more so in regards to hanging out with other kids because I got really weird. You see, I got like really, I was really confused. So it was strange behaviors that I was displaying. Something was going on at home. My home was riddled with all forms of abuse, whether it was sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. And the abuse wasn't just happening to me. It was happening to other people in my, in my family. So like um, my sister and my stepmother and my stepmother was an abusive. So there was a lot of abuse. The dynamics were, were complex as they are in these types of situations. There's domestic violence, there's all kinds of stuff. So that was kind of the norm in my home. And when I then would go to school and want to interact and have friends and be accepted, I was really different. I stood out. And I didn't know why I was standing out. So this is why, again, there's a lot of confusion because something's happening at home. You don't really talk about what's going on in the home 
out because you know it's a little bit weird, but you're not exactly sure. That's how I felt. Like wasn't exactly sure. And and so the challenge was being accepted in school, not feeling like I was other than, which I always felt like I was an outsider, didn't fit in, and couldn't figure out why, which was extremely, extremely painful. One and then developing these um, people pleasing skills. So like. I'm going to morph into anything you want me to be so that you will accept me and be my friend. And I think that's, it's, it's something that even today children are dealing with. And a lot of times don't have language for it, just as I didn't have any language for what was happening. So I think the, I think the biggest thing that's coming to my mind right now, and there's, there's many things I had to overcome, but the premise of this came on this confusion, which rocks which rocked my world. Because if there's confusion about where do I fit in, where do I belong, where's my tribe, am I cared for, am I protected, am I taken care of? As a child, there's no real language for that. There's just this, there's just this upheaval, there's this, this uncertainty about everything. Right. Now for our audience, I would like to refer everyone to a really important resource because if you're experiencing sexual abuse, then more than likely you're experiencing other forms of abuse as well. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So if you go to any search engine and put in the wheel of power and control, this is um, something uh, put together by the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And I just wanna point out for our audience other forms of abuse, because Mm -hmm. if you're experiencing one, more than likely you're experiencing others. So other forms of abuse include minimizing, denying, and blaming. So this would be making light of the abuse and not taking her concerns about it seriously, saying the abuse didn't happen, um, shifting responsibility for abusive behavior saying she caused it. Another form is using isolation, controlling what she does, who she sees and talks to, what she reads, where she goes, um, limiting her outside involvement, using jealousy to justify actions. Another is emotional abuse. This is very big, putting it down, making her feel bad about herself, calling her names, making her think she's crazy, playing mind games, humiliating her, making her feel guilty, using intimidation, making her afraid by using looks, actions, or gestures, smashing things, destroying her property, abusing pets, displaying weapons, using coercion and threats, making and or carrying out threats to do something to hurt her, threatening to leave her, to commit suicide, to report her to welfare, making her drop legal charges and making her do illegal things and then the last three forms include using economic abuse preventing her from getting or keeping a job making her ask for money Mm -hmm. giving her an allowance taking her money not letting her know about or have access to family income using male privilege uh, treating her like a servant making all the big decisions acting like master of the castle being one to define men and women's roles. And the last one is using children, making her feel guilty about the children, using the children to relay messages, using visitation to harass her or threatening to take the women away, the children away. So if you're listening to this broadcast and you're experiencing any form of abuse whatsoever, I strongly recommend that you get help. And you can certainly hire a coach. Um, I myself have great familiarity with this because I spent two years in a support group for a YWCA support group for battered women. So find a support group in your your neighborhood. If you've been, um, if there's been any illegal actions, by all means, get to the police and realize that there are shelters that you can go to. Now, So Veronica Lynn Clark, what are some of the things that you want other people to understand when it comes to healing sexual trauma? 
One of the most important things I think I can communicate is letting go of your attachment to the story. Because for a long time, I stayed in victim mode, even when I didn't realize that I was in victim mode. Because I got to a point when I was about 17 and then 18 that I decided I'm creating a whole new life for myself and I'm going to shove all that stuff into the basement and I'm covering it up. And I built a whole new life. I built a whole new life when I was very successful financially, married, children, all of it. And what, what I didn't do though, is I didn't do my work. I didn't do the work of releasing all of those attachments and beliefs um, that were really distorted based on my childhood. And so all of that was still there. So the one thing, so as soon as something major happened in my life and I had a major catastrophe, um, everything just, everything broke wide open. And I didn't know what to do with all of that, um, all of those experiences that I'd never really faced. People call them shadows. I, I, I also do a lot of shadow work. So we talk about the shadows. So what I had to, what I had to come to terms with was that these experiences happened and as they were happening, I was making decisions about them. I was making the decisions about myself. I was making decisions about the world. I was making decisions about the people who abused and violated me also who I violated as well, you know, in different ways, not sexually. Um, and, and so I had to, I had to realize that I was really attached to the story and that I was letting it define me. And I was living a lot of times in my past making excuses for why I wasn't able to do this, you know, because this has happened to me, then I'm not able to move forward in this way or what have you. So this is complicated. It's not an easy thing that I'm, that I'm expressing because most of us are really invested in our stories. Okay. So as soon as we can start to unravel our attachment, and connection to the story and I'm not undermining I, I, at all anyone's experiences abuse anything like that I, I'll tell you and I don't like talking a whole lot about about the experiences not because they trigger me or anything like that but because I also don't want to feed the details like give the details because then that becomes more like drama the things happened and I, it's like watching an old movie it's like, oh, I remember watching a movie, but I have that little attachment to it. It's gone. And I'm not saying that to say, like, some people have gone through some really horrific things. And so if you're watching this and you've gone through some horrific things in your life, I don't want you to think that I can't relate. Maybe I haven't had the same experiences, but I have certainly had tremendous amount of um, abuse, isolation, death, a, a lot of things that have happened. Being able to release and cut myself free from all of those connections has, has really allowed me to experience a, a lot more freedom in my life where those things are just that, they're experiences. And um, like I said, it's, it's, it's complicated to talk about unraveling the story and letting go of your attachment to the story. It's not something that can really be clearly communicated in like our time frame that we have. And this right. is really what my body of work is based on is learning how, who are we without our stories? Who are we without this, you know, these things that we've gone through and these things that have happened to stop giving power to our past experiences because we're living from our past. We're living from just memories and we're not creating from this place of possibility of love, of truth, of potential. And that blocks us, completely blocks us. And it, and, and it's, it was making me sick. I was, um, at 2008, I was diagnosed with um, post you know, PTSD and I, and I don't subscribe to that. Like that's just, that's not my belief in that. And some people want to, that's again, an investment and a reason <clears throat> to like stay connected to the story. I have PTSD or I have this illness or this is thing, I have anxiety. And so because of this story, this label, I am not able to move forward. Right. So I have a couple of suggestions for our audience. So first of all, mm -hmm. when I do a medical intuitive reading, I'm reading what I call your five bodies, the physical body, 
what's going on with you at the physical level, your energy mm -hmm. system, which includes your chakras, your acupuncture system, and your breath, your emotions, yes. your mind, which are your thoughts and your belief, and also your soul level. So you mm -hmm. mentioned how to change your, how to rewrite your story. So here's a really good way that if you're watching this broadcast or listening, how you can change your story. So what I encourage my clients to do is write your story, whatever it is. This happened, this happened to me, and so on. Mm -hmm. Then what I want you to do is reread it. And as you reread your story, notice any place you get triggered. And what do I mean by triggered? If you read your story and you feel anything other than peace, then you're telling the story in a way that pulls up energy and emotions and literally even chemistry in your body. You're creating a, your brain chemicals by how you tell the story. So yes. write the story, reread it. Notice where you feel unhappy, angry, sad, traumatized. And then what I want you to do is rewrite your story. And how do you do that? You stay 100% truthful. But what you do is you find the lesson. You find the yes. gift. You find your power. So you write, rewrite your story and you you read it again and you keep rewriting your story. And by writing it, I mean literally on a piece of paper, in a journal, writing it out. And you rewrite your story again and again and again and again and again until mm -hmm. when you read about what happened, it's just like, I went to the store, I bought a gallon of milk, I came back, maybe there was a traffic jam, but I got there eventually. Yeah. And, you know, I had personal experience of this. I, I remember I went through a divorce about 10 years ago, and I'm very aware of how much our stories create our neurochemistry. And I did exactly this. So you can rewrite this story. Um, another thing that is very important, I think, to talk about when you talk about abuse is what abuse does to your energy field. And I've oh written articles mm -hmm. about this. Because it, it's a law, there's a law of physics that anytime there's a vertical electrical current, and when you're standing up, you're vertical, mm -hmm. there's a magnetic field perpendicular to that. So we in natural healing refer to that as your energy field or your aura. And if you have been abused in any way, including sexual abuse, um, there'll be holes in the aura. Yeah. So I'm going to give an example of this. Um, one time years ago, I worked with a young man who had been raped. It was very, it was really hard to even, you know, hear his story, but his mother, he was an actor. His mother was late for a play practice and he was jumped by three men. And we're talking about sexual trauma. So healing from sexual trauma. So we assume that it's women, but this happens to men also. Well, long story short, there was literally a hole at the back of his body in his energy field. And when you have holes mm -hmm. in your energy field that makes you hypersensitive to energy, to emotions, yeah. right? Now, I know, Veronica Clark, you teach yoga, yeah. as do I, and how does yoga play in or facilitate healing from abuse, in your opinion? Yeah. Catherine, I'd like to answer that question, but I'd like to also uh, just go back to something that you just mentioned, because this is, I think it's really important, and you're talking about energy. And so, so during this time, this between, I'll start with the six to like 17, because there were so many energy holes in my body, and this is again, adding more to the confusion. This is my fault. I'm attracting this. I'm doing something. I had more than 10 people violate me uh -huh. um, during this time, family members, non-family members. But I'll tell you something specific is that there were there were three different incidences where I attracted um, murderers. And um, so, so I'm mentioning this because this is so important. When we are abused, when you're abused, and, and oftentimes there's these patterns that are ingrained, these patterns, these energy, these energy patterns. And so it's like, it's, it's so subtle, you don't realize on a conscious level that, that we're putting something out and that these, these perpetrators or people are also reading into this energy. And I, and I want to mention when I say perpetrators also, it's to distinguish for this conversation. Um, people who are violating others are also really wounded and completely disconnected from source, right? 
So it is, um, so that, that's another conversation, but I just, I want to say that because I, I've learned to also have a great deal of compassion and forgiveness. And that's part of what my journey has, has helped me to achieve. And I'm grateful for that. But speaking about the energy, and this is, again, very confusing for me. This is just cloudy. This is, and, and when there's confusion, it continues to perpetuate this state of illusion and disembodiment. So there was a lot of like completely disembodied, always disembodied, couldn't even be in my body because it was just too much. Um, had a young man who the first time I attracted him, he, um, he was about 14 and I was 12, raped me. When in 2011, people, I, I was from San Diego County, Detective came from San Diego County and they wanted me to come and testify against this, against this man. His name was um, Michael Baraka and um, Michael Baraka Mason. And he raped and murdered and held hostage other women. Mm -hmm. And I was his first incident, right? I was his first victim. And oh. so they wanted to show the pattern. Aside from that though, later as things progressed in my life and I was probably about, um, 16, 17 years old, I was also with another, with another young man. Um, this time I chose to be there in a sense and he kept me captive. Wouldn't let me go for a while. Finally did let me go, but I, I knew I could feel it in my body, everything. And thank God I've always been connected to my guides and to my sources. And this is when there's sexual abuse at an early age because of so much disembodiment, intuition and knowing and connection with 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 our guides um although again i didn't have any language for that i was very protected but i could feel i could feel that he wanted to kill me and he would have had there not been someone else in there and i was very um so again without going into a whole bunch of details that's not important i'm i'm, I'm mentioning this because you may be able to relate to why you're continuously attracting certain type of people in your life when you've had abuse, when these patterns are still there, when these energetic holes are still in the auric field. Another time I met someone else and later found him on, um, later saw him on America's Most Wanted, okay, for robbery and for murder. I'm not making this stuff up. I mean, this is just, this is what's so befuddling to me. I couldn't understand what was happening. This last time, and this was absolutely the last draw for me because I'd been abused so many times and just, and, and, and at some point I'm just allowing myself to be abused because I had no connection. This body was not my body. This body was someone else's body. If you just wanted to have sex with my body, just had sex with me and I would just disappear. I was just somewhere else. This particular time, because I'd started to change and my energy started to get really dark, really dark because now I was angry and full of rage right? There was a lot of rage. And I started to become um, almost in this, like, uh, this, like, this, wow, this really dark energy. So this, this man, um, we were moving in uh, California. And at this time, I was also doing, um, using drugs, using drugs, because I was starting to numb, 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 continue, be disembodied, not be here. There was no commitment to being here on this planet. And um, this man was also on drugs. And he was, uh, I was about 17, so he was in a, like 55 years old or something like that. And when people are doing drugs, they all hang out together. And that was what was the case. For some reason, as we were packing up, I say for some reason, but I was, we were packing and putting things inside of the trunk. I saw a hammer. I saw a hammer in the, the trunk, just the, just, just the handle. And it didn't let him see that I went ahead and I grabbed the, ha the, the hammer. And I brought it into the front seat. He was driving. I put it into the front seat and I just hit it next to my, um, to my right calf, to my leg. And we were driving and uh, we were moving to a, this, a new apartment. And he didn't live with us. He was just helping my sister and I and her husband and I to, to move. Um, we moved often because that's also what happens <laughs> when you don't have the money to pay the rent and so forth. Um, so I had no idea where we were going. It was raining outside and I was just looking out and all of a sudden he starts to say to me, you're going to be my sex slave. You're going to be my sex slave. I'm not going to let you go. And we knew that this guy 
Willie was his name. It was also a pedophile. And it doesn't matter when you're doing drugs and all the things. It's like, oh, he's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. But he was a pedophile. Mm -hmm. And he was allowed to be around us all the time. And something really snapped inside of me. And I knew immediately why I brought the hammer in there with me. And I clutched the, the hammer. And I was sitting as straight as I could. And I, it just reminds me of the same way that I was sitting when I was with a young man who wanted to who wanted to murder me. And I thought, this is it. I am going to bury the claw of this hammer into his head if he touches me. Because I'd had enough, finally. So it didn't happen. I'm still here. He's alive. I'm, I'm, I'm protected. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. But again, I, I went through this and I wanted to share it because if we do not heal, if we do not look at the story and start to extract these experiences and, and, and be able to see them and look at them without shaming ourselves, without judging ourselves, without feeling, you know, this hate or rage, and it takes time sometimes to unravel that, we keep those holes in our energetic field and we will not heal and we will not be restored back to our natural state. And we will not be able to vibrate at a higher calibration. It's not possible. So slowly, and it took time, it wasn't until my 30s until I, until I really started to heal. I thought I was healing. It wasn't until my 30s that I really started to be able to look at these things and to be able to hold them and then look and turn away and look, turn away and then look and start to have more love and self-compassion for all that was happening and recognize that it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault at all, any of it. And that's an important starting place, really important starting place. So um, I, I want to turn it back over to you for a moment. I know I've been talking a right. lot, but I, I think this has been so, about so yoga. So you've taught yoga for some time. How do yeah. you feel that yoga can help us heal from abuse and also from healing for healing sexual abuse? Well, this was just perfect because it was, as I mentioned, uh, in my 30s when I started to really heal. And that's actually when I started to get life. Um, I went into yoga teacher training and it was such a beautiful path. It was something that first as a, just a practitioner, as an avid practitioner, it just, I felt like it started to really save my life. In my early 30s, I got really suicidal, uh, became really suicidal, going through divorce and everything else. And um, I needed something to funnel and channel that energy. And it was yoga. And um, my kitty. Um, so yoga was what helped me, first of all, to learn how to stay present with myself, to stay present, to become more in my body, to understand what it felt like to be in my body, because that was new, because I had not been in my body. So yoga can help us to, what does it feel like? And this is where that mindfulness also, so being mindful, using the meditation, using breath to come back and anchor into our bodies and that's what helped me so something started to shift and I couldn't tell what it was right away didn't have the language for it and I'd not really shared to the degree that I share now about my past experiences but all of a sudden it's like slowly and then suddenly right that's how it goes <laughs> it was like wow I'm a totally different person like something has shifted and people were saying that and my children saw that and, and it was just different and you know, I decided to teach yoga. I wanted to, to share this with others. So, Well, my yeah. experience having taught yoga now for 24 years yeah. is that yoga, like you said, it helps you to connect to your body. It helps you connect to your feelings. It, it helps you develop the inner and outer strength to handle your emotions so that you can, you know, actually process what happened. But it also opens and balances your energy field. It opens yes. and balances your chakras. It's going to repair that energetic system. It does get damaged, right, through abuse of all kinds of abuse, right? So yes. it basically balances that energy system that's been damaged from abuse. Um, and the other thing that I find, just the practice of yoga, it develops compassion, right? Yes. Right. And that yes. spiritual connection that's so helpful. 
No, we were going back to what you were saying, uh, Veronica Lynn Clark, about the victim and how important it is to let go of the victim. And I talked about how to rewrite your story. Mm -hmm. And another way to go about rewriting your story is when you read your story that you've written, ask yourself who's telling the story. Because any of us could tell this, our story, our life story, from the point of view of victim, yeah. right? But you have to remember that anytime you're playing a role, you're not being your true self, right? And what would it be like to tell the story from the perspective of your soul? Yeah. Right? So if you're telling the story that. from the perspective of your soul, you'd be like, well, mm -hmm. why did I choose this experience? Right? Yes. Why did I yeah. choose this experience? What sort of soul agreement did I have with this person or with these people? Right? Yes. What are, what are they contributing to me? What am I contributing to them? Yes. And when you see things from that spiritual perspective, a lot of times we, what, the, what we find is that the truth of what happened is 180 degrees different than what our victim thought. Yes. Right? right? I just love that you bring this up. I think it's just a really, um, if somebody is, is deep in their victim, it's difficult for them to even fathom that they have some soul agreements and that their soul incarnated in and said yes to this assignment and, and agreed in some ways for these experiences to, to occur, for them to learn whatever lessons that they needed to learn and that there were agreements also made with those who um, were involved. And I, I, that's, a, that's a lot to swallow sometimes for someone. And it was certainly for me too, you know, initially. Like, how could I, how, why would I have chose my parents? Why did I choose them? Why would I have chose to be incarnated into this family? Like, why, no, I don't want this. But that's not true. And um, it was actually, it was actually an experience, my very first experience with um, ayahuasca, that I was able to see, see, clearly all of the breadcrumbs i could see all of the places where it already come before and placed all of the these little places um, of help and support and love and guidance i could see all of it i could see the agreements even that i that i had with with my brothers one brother in particular i could see that right. and i it had just um having that understanding really helps to open up to a lot more compassion and forgiveness. Compassion and forgiveness is, is such a key piece in being able to, to, to heal ourselves and to be able to vibrate higher. We don't, without those pieces, we're still often in, in victim. All right. Now we, of course, are talking about how to heal from sexual abuse. Yes. And our sexuality is such a core part of who we are. Yeah. And how we express intimacy. Mm -hmm. How do you think, Veronica Lynn Clark, people can heal from sexual abuse and go on to have a healthy sex life after experiencing sexual abuse? It's, you know, again, it's one of those things that's, it's not easy just to say, just to speak, per se. I think it takes time, and I think everybody's, everybody's experience with being able to unravel this is a little bit different. It's because, because of the way that um, the abuse has impacted us. It's, 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 it's different for each of us. And so it's really, first of all, if we want to heal and be able to reclaim our sexuality, we have to have a commitment, 100%, all parts of us, that are committed to releasing the victim, releasing the story. It has to happen. It has to be the first foundational piece that you want to reclaim, restore back to your natural state, which is erotic, sexual, innocent. And so that's the first piece. Are, are there any parts of me that wants to still stay stuck here? Um, this is what I work with women on all the time. And, and so it's very individual, one-on-one -on -one basis. It's very soft, tender, because we have to learn how to be soft. We're not taught that, especially when we're being abused. 
It's very much the opposite. Um, so there's this softness, learning how to be soft with oneself, learning how to speak kindly, learning really what it is to love self, not just bathing and all of those things, which are really essential, but really being tender, being the mother that you needed, being the father that you needed, being the whoever, like learning how to be soft and gentle. All of these pieces are essential to being able to reclaim your sexuality fully. I'm talking about it holistically. It's a whole thing. I also work with women in, in larger groups because it's important for us to be able to learn what is safe touch. How do we understand and learn what our boundaries are? How can we speak what our boundaries are? I've never had any boundaries because I didn't know even what boundaries were since everyone was violating them, right, from a young age. And we don't know that we actually have boundaries. So when I work with women in groups, we, 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 we create these experiences where we can learn how to practice feeling our boundaries, speaking, using our voice, to be able to express what our boundaries are, that can be super uncomfortable for people because it's like, if you're a people pleaser, you don't want to express your boundaries. Mm -hmm. You piss somebody off, they might abandon you, reject you, whatever, you don't want that. So all of these pieces are really important to being able to reclaim sexuality. Before we even get to the part of like connecting with, um, connecting with our yoni, so to speak. Um, so it's, um, it's really beautiful. I call this process is falling in love with yourself, like really falling in love with yourself, learning how to step more softly, move more slowly, be very conscious, be very present with everything that you're doing. When you're eating food, when you're, when you are bathing, when you're brushing your hair, when you're practicing yoga, that this is, you're learning how to use your body as this prayer. It's coming back to the body, coming back to self in the most loving, most loving, compassionate way. Because until we can really love ourselves fully, like really love ourselves, then there's, then there's still like, uh, am I just giving my sex away? Is this like, we have to love self enough to be able to be empowered, to be able to share our sexuality and then understand that we're sharing our sexuality from this place that's very sacred, and very loving and healing and nourishing this nourishing. Veronica Lynn Clark, I really appreciate that you talked about self-love. One of the best things that I've ever read about abuse is that if you have been abused in any way, sexually, mentally, emotionally, physically, in any way, it's easier frequently for someone who's been abused to come to the belief, this is the mental part, that there's something mm -hmm. wrong with you. Absolutely. That you're damaged, that you're not good enough, that that you're bad. Yep. And by clearing, doing the deep inner work to clear, so here's some common beliefs that I would clear if I'm working with a client who's been abused. Um, I'm bad. You want to shift that to knowing that you're good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm unlovable. Like you said, to know and experience that you are lovable. Um, mm -hmm. That your sexuality is sacred, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and, and again, that there's nothing wrong with you, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. you're a soul having a spiritual experience, that you're a good person, and mm -hmm. letting go of this, of all this self-talk about there being something wrong with you, or that you're unlovable. Yeah. Now you, Veronica Lynn Clark, you put together a program called the Body Temple Program yes. that empowers women to embrace their sexuality. Yes. So you talked about some of the steps that you go through in helping people heal from their abuse. What are the major components of the Body Temple Program? The major components, um, again, the, 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 the absolute foundation of everything that I do comes back to falling in love with ourselves, loving ourselves wholly and completely. Mm -hmm. And so Body Temple um, is comprised of different, um, different, uh, different immersions. I have a immersive weekends where we come together for three days and do some really deep work um, where we ha I have different practices, different rituals that women participate in. Some of them can be really triggering 
um, especially just depending on where they are in their in their journey. And they're not intended to be triggering, but they can be because we're dealing with sexuality. We're we're also seeing ourselves, you know, in, in naked. Um, so this can be really uncomfortable. This isn't all just at once. There's a whole process. But I'm, I want to give some. Ex I want to discuss this because this is part of the healing. Can I just be who I am? learning that I am loved and supported by all these other women who are also experiencing this process with me, that we're healing together. In many ways, it's like we're going back into like these temples that women were part of thousands and thousands of years ago. And we're recreating this type of experience for each other to learn what it's like to be in sisterhood, to learn what it's like to be loved by each other, to be nurtured, to receive a mothering touch, to receive the touch of a lover, if perhaps that's what one experience right everything in my retreats anything in my immersions it's all choice right like you are always it's so important to me that women remember that they're sovereign beings right you now for our mm -hmm. audience you know one of the ways that you can go about learning to love your body maybe even for the first time is an exercise that you can do by yourself. And what I recommend people do is get an eyeliner or um, a lip pencil, something that will wash off, right? And if, if you're in your own, the comfort of your own home, strip down, either start naked or maybe to your underwear, whatever you feel comfortable, and literally take your eyeliner or eyebrow pencil and write on the parts of your body, I love you. Yes. Especially the parts of your body that you maybe had trouble with, like your thighs, your buttocks, or your breasts, or your belly. And give your physical body mm -hmm. the message, I love you. Yes. One of the things that I'm always pointing out to my clients, you can't heal your body if you hate it. I can't uh, heal your body if uh, you hate it. Yeah. No, right? I, we're so on the same page. Yeah, that's exactly. Those are some of those. Those are some of the homework practices. Absolutely. Right. What are some other exercises that you share with your students and clients so that they can actually learn to love their physical? And this is something that's helpful for all of us, even those of us who haven't experienced abuse. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because because oftentimes we're disconnected from our sexuality and from our bodies for many different reasons. It could be for religious purposes. It could be just from body shaming. It could be, you know, as we were growing up, it doesn't being disconnected from our bodies and being um, not owning our sexuality, not really embodying that. It happens for so many different reasons and sexual abuse is one one of those pathways but for us to really um to be vibrant to be radiant is to love ourselves love our bodies own our sexualities be able to own our voice and speak from this really sovereign place so we have so, i have so many different beautiful practices for one with body temple for example i do one-on-one -on -one coaching also so we do one-on-one -on -one coaching I also offer different journaling prompts and things with voice recordings and audio so that they have daily practices for them to be able to, um, to be able to practice. Because you're right, coming, coming together in an immersion, if you haven't done a little bit of work beforehand, is not comfortable. It's not, that's not safety for women. And that's like the most important thing is having the trust and the love um, of women is, is especially right. if you've experienced things, is, it's really essential. So you talked about one of the things which is, um, writing, and I use that practice often, mirror work, being able to see yourself, love yourself, speaking sweetly to yourself, hmm. spending time intentionally to create little rituals, whether it is just sitting, uh, letting all your children know or family, anybody know that you are in a special time for yourself where you're just speaking sweetly to yourself, having candles, um, journaling, writing, singing a love song to yourself, writing something for yourself, but just doing these sweet, loving things that we need it. Again, this is, it, it's a lot more than just being able to express it in a short period of time, but I work with all the different types of archetypes. So depending on where you were in your developmental stages and wherever the abuse happened, like there's different points where we might need to heal the, the little girl. So there's different practices specifically for the little girl. 
And then there might be something else for your teenage self. And so there's some different practices there. So it's very specific and unique. And then for the mother or for, you know, the, the so different stages, there's different practices because you need a different voice. You need to pull in a different archetypal energy in order to help address that particular wound so it can be healed. Right. And, you know, one of the most powerful practices, whatever stage you're at, is forgiveness work. Ho'oponopono. You know, yes. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Yes. I love you. And oh starting gosh. by forgiving yourself for yes. what happened, right? And yes. forgiving everyone around you. So mm -hmm. Veronica Lynn Clark, any final thoughts for our audience? Hmm. Choose to really love yourself, to, to fully love yourself, to embody, to recognize that you are so necessary and so needed in this lifetime, that you chose to come here to this lifetime for a reason. And when we're attached to our stories and all the experiences and the things that have happened, it creates these illusions that keep us trapped in bondage and it keeps us bound. And we're not able to actualize we're not able to really mobilize why we have come here to this planet and you're needed we need you i know i've gone through what i've gone through because i'm now able to have the depth of compassion and the understanding so that i can also reach out and so i can share and who knows what it is that you have to offer you have so many beautiful gifts and so much to give Releasing yourself from the stories is going to allow you to be able to step into a much greater vibration. You're going to be able to love yourself so much more and be able to live, live more fully. Live, live, live fully. Let your soul live here on this earth. Right. You've been listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio, your global feel-good radio. Remember, it is possible to heal from sexual abuse and all yes. kinds of abuse. This is Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Our guest today has been Veronica Lynn Clark, intimacy and empowerment coach. You can find out more about Veronica Lynn Clark and her wonderful work at veronicalynnclark.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.